Well, 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 we're finally here. This is a moment two years in the making. It's time to finish the PowerShell series. I started this series in 2021. PowerShell was always a thing I felt was poorly explained on YouTube, and I wanted to change that. When I started this series, I wanted to follow one simple goal, to make the most well-edited, well-explained, and well-presented PowerShell content on YouTube. For anyone who's watched up to this point, I'll just say this, thank you. All this content is useless if no one watches it, so you being here has made it all worth it. I hope the series helped you, helped you understand all the otherwise confusing behaviour of PowerShell, and made it feel more approachable as a whole. And if it has, then that's a success. I'm not going to do a massive speech about everything, we all have things to do, I just wanted to lead up with that, and with that out of the way, it's time. No more stalling, no more waiting, the final Learn PowerShell episode starts now. I'm going to split this video into two parts. Part 1 is going to finish the topics I wanted to get through in this series, and part 2 is going to talk about where you can go in your time with PowerShell once this series is gone. PowerShell is huge, and I have absolutely not covered everything there is to know in this series. There's still so much out there to learn. And now that you know all the underlying concepts, the hope that I always had is it's now very easy for you to learn about new things and understand the official documentation at this point. I got a lot to get through today, so let's just jump straight into it. Last time we looked at functions, this being the exact script we ended on. Just as a quick recap, functions are custom commands we've made in our code, with this being what they look like. And when you make functions, there are two important characteristics you can give them. You can return data back from them as we do with the return keyword, and you can also put parameters on the functions using these param blocks. As mentioned, you put this inside the function at the top, and now the function takes in these things. If any of you have come from other programming languages, you may have noticed that these param blocks are a bit weird. In most programming languages, the way you say what parameters a function takes in is usually very attached to this bit. But in PowerShell, these param blocks feel like they're kind of just slapped in there. The way they just sit in the middle of the function, alongside the actual code, it is a bit of a weird way of describing parameters, right? for this to be how PowerShell does parameters. But there's actually a reason for this. There's a reason these param blocks feel so disconnected from the function. And it's because functions aren't the only things you can use these param blocks on. To be exact, there's actually one really useful place we can use these param blocks that's not a function. On our scripts. We can make our scripts take in parameters by putting a param block at the top of them. And before I show you how all that works, I want to start by explaining why you'd even want to do such a thing. Almost every single script we've made in the series so far has needed extra info from the user. And every time we've taken in extra input from the user, we've used read host to get it. And that is a perfectly valid way for taking in data from the user especially for very interactive scripts, like the points tracker script we made, which was really almost like a little program. But for scripts that aren't quite so interactive, if you can make them without using read host, you should. And you should prefer using a param block to make your script take in actual parameters, as opposed to using read host. And there are many reasons for this. The first reason you might want to use parameters instead of putting read host in your script is read host makes it really hard to automate the running of your script. Imagine you write a script that does something, and the person using that script wants to take that script and run that script in a particular way across thousands of computers all at once. Well, if you have a read host in it, they can't do that, because the script will literally pause itself and wait for an input on every single PC. And maybe you can hack around that by emulating key presses or something ridiculous, but that's just silly. Putting read host in our scripts makes them very hard to automate, and PowerShell is all about automation. With parameters on the script, it's possible through some means to provide what you want to those parameters as it gets sent out. But read host is just going to make the script get stuck on every single device you run it on, waiting for the user to literally type input. 
So that's the first issue of putting read hosts in scripts that don't need it. You're blocking flexibility for what can be done with it. The next issue is, when you have read hosts getting information from the user, the user is forced to only type text. For example, let's say you're writing a script that compares the hash of two files and sees if they're equal. If you have two read hosts, the only thing the user can do is manually type out, or copy and paste, the names of each file. And that's fine, but what if they've already loaded the files into variables? What if they already have the file infos ready to go in their variables and they want to just give those file infos to the script? Well, they can't. The only way they can tell the script what files to use is to type in their names, which could be really inconvenient. So once again, not having parameters they can just give the script is limiting the user. And the final reason, that may be one that'll convince you, is sometimes it's just easier for you as the scriptwriter. Imagine if you want to, say, write a script that takes in a list of files from the user and combines their contents together. If you want to take in a list of files using read host, you'd probably have to write an entire while loop with all kinds of logic to let the user have some kind of interactive way to enter in all the files. And there is a time and place for that. Sometimes what you're trying to do with a script is make a very interactive experience. But if you're just writing a quick script to do a given thing, instead of using read host to get info from the user, use parameters. So let me show you how we do it. We're going to put together a script that takes a bunch of files and compares their file hashes. And the way it takes in those files will be with a parameter. Just a quick note before we start on this script, don't get confused with hash tables here. I know this script is looking at file hashes and PowerShell has something called hash tables, but they're completely unrelated things that just happen to have the same name. File hashes is just a very short summary of the data in a file. A hash table is a collection with keys and values in it. Different things. Now, to start our script, let's put in a param block and add a parameter, since that's how we're taking in the files to compare the hashes of. Now, what type of object is this parameter going to take in? Well, we're looking at files, so what I think would make the most sense is to take in an array of file info objects. Technically, you could also make it a string array if you want, but we'll do an array of file info to be as specific as possible. And remember that even though we're using file info here, the user can still type text when providing what to put in this parameter, and PowerShell will cast it for them. There is an issue with that cast, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit when we try to use the script. But for now, let's go with file info. Just one thing to be careful of, this on its own won't work, because you need the full name of the type, which is system.io.fileinfo. I'll talk more about how to find info like that out in the second half of the video. And we'll just call this parameter files. Our script compares files, these are the files it's going to compare. Makes sense to call it that. Great, and now we have an array ready to go. If we didn't do this, we'd have to write out a whole while loop input thing that gets a bunch of file names from the user. But with the parameter, it's already put into an array for us by the user. So, since we're really making this script, how do we do this? Comparing the file hashes. This is the goal of the script. The script will compare the hash of every file given and if all of them match, if all of them have the same hash, it'll give true. If they don't match, it'll give false. All right, so as always when writing scripts, let's go through step by step what we need to do. In order to compare the hashes of the files, we need to actually get the hashes of the files involved somehow. So let's get that in here first. What we want to do is take each file and in a for each, somehow extract the hash of each one. So how do we do that? Well, we need to figure out some way of getting the hash of a file. And the very first thing that comes to my mind is to see if there's a command that gets the hash of a file for us. We'll use get command that I mentioned back in episode two. And we'll look for something that contains the word hash somewhere in it. Just like this. Ah, get file hash. That sounds good. We are getting the hash of a file. And what I always like to do is try out a command in a PowerShell window, so we know exactly what we're dealing with in our script. So let's get the hash of a random file, and we'll see what it gives back here. Right, so we can see here, this command is giving back an object with three properties on it. The only property we really care about in this object is this hash property here. I don't care about these things, I just want to grab out the actual hash data in the middle here. 
So what we're really looking to do is run get file hash on each file, then pick the hash out of there. So firstly, let's take our files, and for each one, run get file hash, giving get file hash the current item with dollars underscore. And as we just saw when we tried it out, that's giving us an array of all these objects with these three properties on them. But what we want to do is grab just the hash bit out of each object. Two ways of doing this come to mind. We could add a second for each to the end here to take each of these objects and extract the hash out of them. But we could actually also just do it all in here. We can just take the object from get file hash and grab the hash out of it like this. So it's all together in one for each. This works great. Remember, if you do this, you've got to put these brackets around the command. So it treats the command like a single thing, a single block. Without the brackets, it thinks you're trying to access the hash of the dollars underscore, but we're trying to access the hash of the whole command's result. Alright, so we have all of our hashes in this array. Now we need to somehow detect if they're all the same or not. There's kind of two ways of doing this that come to my mind, and one is more out of the box thinking than the other. Let's start with the more normal way, which is to write it out ourselves with a loop. There are a few things you can do to structure this, and I'll give you a rundown of the main different ways. This is a bit of a tricky thing to do, this is a very programming-like problem, and it's really hard to just teach the sort of logical thinking complex problems like this need. The best I can do is just take you through my thought process from start to finish. We want to identify if all the items in the array are the same. So I know we're going to need to loop through each item in some way. We need to check something on every single one, so I'll just slap in a for each now. Not sure what I'll do in here just yet. Alright, so we're going through each item, and what we're really going to be trying to determine is if any of these items we go through are different from the rest. If we see an item that's different from the rest, then, well, we know they don't all match. And if we make it all the way through the array without seeing anything off, they're all the same. Now, we could put some code in here to compare every item with every other item. And if that's what you're thinking, if you're thinking, right, we're going to take this item and we're going to compare this item against every other item, that will work. You can do that. But that's going to be quite messy and difficult. We'll need a loop inside the loop to do that. You can go that way, it'll just be long. So I'm asking myself if there's a better way, and there is. Remember that what we're trying to figure out is whether any of these items we go through are different. So how about this? Here's an idea. What if we just compare each item to the first one? If all the hashes are exactly the same, they will all match the first item. But if a single one of those hashes are different from the rest, that one won't match the first item. Or if the first is different from all the rest, that one won't match either. So, for each of the items, we're going to ask whether they match the first one. Right, I'll drop an if in here. Now it's coming together. Alright, so I'm going to put in some comments just for my thinking. This is something I really like to do as I'm writing more complicated algorithms, which this is. I like to write comments of what I'm planning on doing, and then just kind of thinking about how it goes. So, this code here runs if any of the items are different from the rest. So if we go into this if statement, then we know they don't match. So that's one case sorted. If they don't match, it's going to come in here and then we'll know that they don't match. Okay, so how do we determine if they all match? How do we deal with that case? Well, you may think put an else on this if, but that won't quite work. We don't know that they all match until this loop finishes, until it's done them all. Putting an else on here and treating that as they all match is like asking a bunch of kids in a class if they did their homework, and as soon as one says they did, you decide that all of them did. The other way makes sense. If one kid says they didn't do it, then you know for a fact the whole class didn't do it, but you can't determine from one kid saying they did it that the whole class did. To actually figure out whether they all match, what we really need to ask is, once we've exited the loop, once we've done every item, what we actually need to ask is, did we come into this if? If at any point during the loop we came into this if, they clearly don't match. But if we went the entire loop without ever coming into this if, that's the situation we'll get ourselves in when they all match. We'll have finished the loop without ever entering the if. That's what's going to happen if they all match. That's the scenario we need to look for here, to determine if they all matched. 
I think the best way of doing this, the best way of keeping track of whether we've come into this if or not, is to make a boolean that keeps track of whether we've ever come in here. If we do go in here, it makes the boolean false, and down here, we can ask, was the boolean ever set to false, to determine if we came into the if at any point. Let me show you. I'll make the boolean up here, and call it matching. And we start by assuming this is the case. We start by assuming they all match, until we're proven wrong by this if, where we set it to false. And then we can just compare down here, to see, once we've done all the items, whether the if ever got triggered or not. That was a lot of talking, but hopefully looking at the code can kind of make sense to you. This is an almost perfect algorithm here, and if you're new to programming, I'm sure some of that was just like, yeah, I'd never think of that. And that's okay. Just get something down and debug it, watch it run, see how it's running, see if it doesn't do what you expect, how you could change it to do what you expect. And you will land on something. Efficiency probably isn't the priority. That's the best advice I can give. And just with time, you'll pick up patterns, you'll get better at it, just make stuff. Anyway, anyway, we can now print out matching hashes if they are matching, and not matching if they're not. Just one quick improvement we could make to this before I move on. If I enter this if statement, if we find an item that doesn't match, there's actually no point in keeping the loop going. As soon as we've set this boolean to false, as soon as we've seen one item that doesn't match, well, that's it. This boolean is false, we know they don't all match, we're done here. There's actually no point in keeping the loop running if we've found an item that doesn't match. That's just extra processing for the computer. So to make this truly perfect, we can also add a break inside the if. So as soon as it sees one item that doesn't match the rest, that's it. Boolean goes to false, we stop even looking. No point in doing that, and we let it come down here and it'll decide from there. And this script is exactly what we need. There's also a shorter way of doing this, which is to use select with the unique parameter. With that, you can take the array of hashes, and filter it down to a new array, with only the unique hashes present. Then we can just look at the length of that, and if there's more than one item, that means there was more than one hash value. So we can determine from that, if they all match or not. That's a really clever way of doing it, and I think conceptually that's actually easier to understand than writing out the algorithm properly. So there's just kind of two different ways you can go with it. Now, let's try out this script. So, we know that it takes in an array of file infos, and I'm just going to use strings here, because PowerShell will automatically cast the strings we give into file info for us. So here, I've given it two matching files, and if I run it with these, it works. Great. And if I change one of these files, now it fails. So all is working as expected. If the files match, it's saying matching hashes. If they don't match, it's saying not matching. Great. It's exactly what we want. Now. This script is working, but I do want to bring up a really important annoyance I have with PowerShell, and it is definitely something to keep in mind. It's about how PowerShell deals with casting from strings to file info. Because of the way this script is written, the way this parameter is set up to take in file info objects is fine. This just happens to work okay, but you see, there's one really really stupid issue with how PowerShell deals with doing this cast from string to file info. Unfortunately, and I'll admit this kind of ruins the narrative I've set up the past few episodes, but blame PowerShell for this. PowerShell does a really stupid thing when you cast from strings to file info. When you cast from a string to file info, it doesn't search for the file name you give in the current directory, but rather system32. Let me show you this not using our script. If we take a look at the files we have in this folder, you can see that 2.txt is in here. But if I try to grab a file info object of this file by taking the file name and casting it to file info, which is what's automatically happening when we run our script, you'll see that the file info object we got from this cast is completely empty. It didn't find the file. This cast did not find the file in the current directory. That's because it searches in a completely unrelated place for 2.txt. To actually create a file info for a file in the current folder, you can either give it the entire path to the file here, or use the getItem command. 
and give it the file name like this. Now we get a proper file info object. The casting operator for file info is unfortunately too stupid to not look in the current directory and goes looking off in there. Now, in the case of our script, we're lucky because we give the file info objects to get file hash, which takes in strings. So, what's happening here is it's casting from the file info we had in the array into a string. And when you have broken file info objects like this, that cast does actually work correctly. So the script happens to work right now because the file infos are turned into strings, which does actually work. But if our script tried to actually access properties on these file info objects we get, it would all go very wrong. So I'm going to give some advice now. I really like making parameters as clear and explicit as possible. Seeing array of file infos is much more descriptive than array of strings. But you actually risk your script not working because it might cast wrong. And that's really no good. So what I recommend you do, and it looks like get file hash and all the built-in commands are following this advice. If you make a function or script that accepts a file, make it take in a string. Don't take in file info because you risk that cast not happening properly if you use file info. And from here, if your script needs to access data about the file it's been given, it can take the string it received and give it to get item to make a file info. Don't get the user to mess with it. Take in a string, and if you need a file info from that string, use get item in the script to do that. The good thing is changing this to string still doesn't impact the user. If the user has a file info in a variable, they can still give this file info object to the script because PowerShell does cast from file info to string correctly. That's okay. It's just backwards going from a string to file info that the casting doesn't quite work properly. So basically what I'm saying is don't take in file infos on your scripts or functions because making file infos out of strings through casting is really dumb. I really hate it. I think it's a huge oversight. As with a lot of the issues I have with PowerShell, there is a sort of reason the cast works like this. It's to do with .NET and how it's actually using .NET's current path system, but it's still really irritating how it behaves like this. I think it's a huge oversight. But that's it. If your script or function is taking in a file, don't make the parameter type file info. You just avoid any casting going wrong. All right, it's time. The final two topics of the series. I want us to take a look at this script we just wrote for a second. Now, when you look at this script, you'll notice that we made a lot of variables, right? We made a hashes variable, we made this boolean, and we even made this variable up here for the parameter. We've made all of these variables in this script. So I want to ask you a question, just to get you thinking a bit. If I take my script and I run my script in PowerShell, right? So PowerShell takes this script and executes all the lines in it. How comes I can't access these variables after the script finishes running? Look, I run the script, and now let's say I try to look at the variable, I don't know, hashes. It's empty. There's no hashes in here. But the script did set the variable hashes while it was running. So how is this possible? How comes we can't see the variables the script changed? It makes sense you wouldn't want the variables inside the script to potentially interfere with your stuff outside. That's exactly why it exists. But the question is, is there a name for this? And is there a way we can control this functionality? And the answer to both is yes. This is known as scoping. It's the idea that everything you set up, be it variables or even functions, we'll get to that in a minute, essentially stays inside the thing you made it in and doesn't make its way outside. So in this case, because of scoping, every change I made to the variables inside the script stays inside the script. Those variable changes don't come out to us here once the script finishes. It doesn't work the other way around. Our script can still get variables we made out here. So if I have a script that prints out variable ABC and I set ABC out here, then run my script, the script has no problem getting that variable I set. But if I try to change ABC inside the script, this change is only going to affect the script because there's a scope here. 
The script is designed so it doesn't naturally interfere with our PowerShell experience outside. Think of it like the script kind of has a box around it, containing all the changes it's made. All the changes the script makes to the variables stay inside the script's little box, and as soon as the script stops running, we get rid of that box and the changes you made are gone. Scripts also aren't the only thing affected by scoping. There's also another thing with its own scopes, its own boxes around it. Functions. Every function has its own scope, its own set of variables, and once again, this is to provide the caller with reassurance. It's to reassure you that when you call a certain function, it's not going to go and trash all your variables. And if you think about it, if you didn't have that reassurance that a function won't trash all your variables, you'd have to constantly check the code in a function every time you call it, just to be sure it doesn't overwrite any of the variables you're using. And that would just defeat the whole point of using functions. So let me show you this scoping in action on some functions. Here I have a variable called name and I have a function called set name that prints the old name, changes the name variable, then prints the new name, and I call it twice. Let's follow through this code ourselves and work out what you'd expect to get if there was no scoping going on. Let's just think this through. So we set name to Alex, and the very next thing we do is call the function. So we go up here and print old name colon Alex. Then we change the variable to Tom, and it prints new name Tom. Then we come back down here and let the function run again. This time our name variable is Tom, so we get old name Tom, and then we'll change it to Tom again and print that. So we get this on the right. This is what you'd expect to see if there was no scoping going on. The name change from the first function call is carrying over to everything else, even the second function call. But let's see what we really get if we actually run this code. Look at that. That is not the same as you'd expect without. So the first line is the same, because as I said, the scoping has no impact on getting our variable. The function is still happy to access the name out here, but it's this set that's behaving differently because of the scope. In the real program, with the scoping going on, this line doesn't actually change the name fully, but instead only changes the name for this particular function call. So in reality, our variables really look more like this. The name on the outside of the script is still Alex, it's just that inside the function, the name has changed now. If we keep going, it prints Tom, because that variable change did affect the function, but as soon as we return from the function, that name variable goes back to being Alex again. That box that had the name change in it was only temporary, only valid in the function scope. So as soon as we came out of the function, that change is now gone. And it doesn't matter that I'm calling the same function the second time. Once we left that first call, that scope change is gone. So that resulted in the second function just seeing Alex again and doing the same all over again, which once again will not carry over after it returns. And this is what scoping is, the idea that each script or function will automatically refuse to affect variables outside it, for that safety so you know it won't trash stuff. So now that we know what it is, how can we control it? Well, there's two tools we can use to control the scopes we have going on. The first one is called dot sourcing. This is an operator that you use when you call something, and it tells PowerShell to make the scope of the thing you're calling the same as what you're in right now. So looking at this script, if I, instead of calling these two functions normally, called them with the dot source operator, PowerShell will actually run these functions in this scope. There's no more box anymore. That particular function call doesn't make its own box. It shares the box of the outside script. So they do affect my variable out here. And similarly, if I want to run a script and have all the variables the script use stay, I can also make that happen with dot sourcing. To dot source call a particular thing, to call something with no scope applied, you just write a dot followed by a space, followed by what you want to call. And that's the dot source operator. So if I head into my script and dot source both of these calls, they're now all happening in the same scope. There's no special scope on each of them anymore. So if I run the script now, 
now it behaves how we expected it to without scoping. And similarly, if I run my script from earlier with a dot and space before it, now I can access all the variables that were in there. So that's pretty fun. And there's also one other way of controlling scoping. And unlike dot sourcing that's in control of the caller, this one can be done inside a functional script to specifically make a particular set access a different scope. Each of these scopes I've mentioned, each of these boxes, if you will, from the overall box that holds everything, to the box our script makes, to the box each of our functions have, they each have their own names. The box, all the variables we've typed out here directly, is called the global scope, because it's, well, global to everything. The scope in our script is called the script scope, because it's, well, yeah. And the scope in our functions is called the local scope. Now, obviously, as always, there is a lot more to it than that. There's a whole bunch of other scopes and all sorts of stuff going on, but that's the general gist. And what we can do is when we set our variables, we can specifically ask for that set to affect a particular scope. So in our function here, instead of dot sourcing the whole thing, what I can do is I can write script colon name. And what this tells PowerShell is to access the name variable as it is in our script scope. So don't apply this function scope to this set. Change the name in the script scope. And now once again, it behaves like you'd expect without the scoping. I wouldn't use this much, but there are some select scenarios this could be needed. There's one with graphical interfaces I can definitely see that you'd need this for. But for the most part this isn't too useful, I just wanted to give you some awareness of it so you're not confused if you see it. Variables aren't the only thing affected by scoping. Making functions is also affected by scoping. In this script here, I'm defining the setName function, but yet you'll notice that after I run the script, I can't actually access this function out here. That's once again because this function is only defined in the script scope. I have to dot source the script to use this function outside it. And this is actually a really good use for dot sourcing. In the past, I've had scripts that literally just contain functions in them. They don't do anything when you run them. They just contain a massive bunch of functions. And then I can dot source that script to bring those functions into PowerShell here so I can use them. That's a genuine thing you can do. That's something you could use dot sourcing for. In, in fact, I think in practice, that's pretty much the only thing it is used for, to bring in a bunch of functions from a script file that you actually want to use in here. However, using scripts like that is a little bit hacky. Although it is absolutely a valid thing for you to do sometimes, PowerShell has another feature specifically designed to let you make reusable functions, and they're called PowerShell modules. The problem with using scripts to hold functions is two things. Firstly, every time you want to use those functions, you have to find the script and dot source it in. You can't just easily tell PowerShell, oh yeah, when you start, can you just automatically dot source this script in? That's just kind of odd. And if you can figure out some way to automate that, it's still a little odd. And secondly, this doesn't work very well if you want to distribute these functions across many machines. If you have a network of machines and you want to easily make these functions accessible on all of them, you'd have to get this script file into some shared place and then figure out some way of doing the auto dot sourcing and just, yeah. It can all be done, but PowerShell has a feature built right in that's specifically designed for making reusable functions that you can just bring in, and that's modules. I actually mentioned PowerShell modules all the way back in episode 2, if you remember this diagram. At the bottom you have the CLR, and then .NET, then on top of that we have PowerShell. And alongside PowerShell, there's also .NET libraries, which are basically .NET modules, which you can install and import in to bring in more types and static methods. And then finally, on top of all that, and on top of PowerShell, we have PowerShell modules. A module is basically a group of functions, aliases, and any other reusable PowerShell thing put together into one importable block. You can import modules into your PowerShell and their functions will always be available. There are three types of modules, binary modules, script modules, and module manifests. 
it sounds like a lot to know, but the names do explain what they are quite well. Binary modules are PowerShell modules written in C Sharp or some other .NET language and compiled into a binary file. For obvious reasons, I'm not going to cover how to make these in this series. Just know that they exist and you can use them like you can use other modules. Next we have Module Manifest. This is a module that doesn't directly contain any functions or definitions, but Vava provides a list of smaller modules to essentially combine together as one. I won't talk too much about this type in this series either. You could learn more about it if you ever need it in the future. And finally, our script modules. And these are what we're going to be looking at in this video. A script module is a module created by essentially a PowerShell script. Let me show you. Something I use PowerShell for a lot is to use a command line program called FFmpeg. This is a command line only program that lets you take video files, audio files, whatever you like, and lets you perform operations on them. Be it converting from one file to another, or be it trimming them, or pretty much anything. I use this tool a surprising amount, but sometimes doing certain things in it do get very cumbersome. What I want to do is set up a few functions that I have available all the time to help do some common actions for me. And that's exactly what I've done here. I've made a few functions here for some common tasks that I commonly use FFmpeg for. And these are completely real world functions here. I'm not simplifying anything here. This is actually a real function that I use on a daily basis. This here is what PowerShell ends up looking like in practice. This is what it looks like. It did take a bit of fiddling when I made them to get them working. I had to look at get member and stuff to figure out certain properties, but I got them here. These functions take in an array of files, which is just for convenience so I can apply these to lots of files at once. Then they go through each file that they're given, grab the file info of each one, and run ffmpeg from there as necessary. Technically I could just put this bit right here, but for neatness I decided to put it on its own line here, just to make it clear that we're deciding on a destination. The second function is fairly long, but hopefully the comments do break it down for you. And again, stuff like how you'd figure out that this exists, that's what I'm going to get to at the end of the video. How you can research and find out things like this. While we're looking at real world PowerShell code, I do also want to briefly bring up the names of the functions here. A lot of the times we've been making functions in PowerShell throughout this series, we've gotten a warning on these names. You can try it out yourself, make a function with some random name, and you'll probably get a yellow line under it warning you. Those warnings are appearing because the functions we made weren't using the approved PowerShell verbs. And what it means by that is this word before the hyphen. PowerShell doesn't like when we use words they don't allow before the hyphen. What it really wants is for us to use only approved already decided on verbs. You don't have to do it, but it's always recommended that you only use specific words here before the hyphen of your function names. Now, if you want to find out what words are approved, what words they are happy for you to put in your function names, you can either Google search it online, or you can go into PowerShell and, well, get the verbs. So these are all the words that PowerShell allows you to use before the hyphen. And you'll notice that I only used approved words in this script here. All right. So I have these functions, and what I want to do is take these functions and put them into a module. Then install that module so these functions are always there in my PowerShell installation wherever I go. To make a module, literally all we have to do is put these functions into a file with a psm1 file extension instead of a ps1. And now this is a script module. To install this module, to make these functions always accessible from PowerShell, what we need to do is we need to copy this file into one of PowerShell's module folders. We can get a list of all those folders by accessing the variable env colon ps module path. And there's a nice list of all the folders you can put modules into to have them be installed. Different folders have different uses. Some of these folders are attached to our user profile and will only load the modules when we use our user account while other folders are attached to the machine and will be loaded for every user. And some of these folders are also for specific PowerShell versions. So if you want certain modules to load in certain PowerShell versions, you just need to put them into the specific folder for that version. And that will load it only on that version. For the sake of this example, 
I'm going to put this module into my user profile folder here. So what we need to do is go into this folder here and we need to make a subdirectory for our module. I'm going to call this ffmpeg funks because it's a bunch of functions for ffmpeg. And we can now put our psm1 file into this folder. Now in my case, if you take a look here, I actually have a bunch of other modules installed as well that I got from the internet. And if I go into the folders, you can see how they sort of organize themselves. They put themselves into their own folders, as we just did, and then they put version numbers within those folders. And you could maybe do this with your module if you like, but we'll leave it like this for now. And now, just like that, my functions will always be available. They are installed on my user profile. We've done it. We've completed everything for this series. All the key points I wanted to hit, all the things I wanted to go through, they're done. So where do you go from here? Well, there's kind of two different paths I think you can take from this point onwards, and I think maybe a little bit of both is a good idea. The first path is to go straight from this series into actively learning more, looking to learn more content. And the second path is to just get out there and start using PowerShell regularly and learn from that. Generally, I'd recommend sticking to the second path the most, but I want to tell you about both so you know where to go regardless. I'll start with where you can learn more about PowerShell. The absolute best place, especially for the position you're in now after completing the series, to get PowerShell knowledge from is, well, the official PowerShell documentation. In the description, I have a link to this page here, and over here on the left is the official documentation, the official descriptions of everything that's available in PowerShell. There's lots of stuff in here, and the best thing is to just look around and really engage with the content about the language in here. For example, in learning PowerShell, they have their own series called PowerShell 101 that you can read if you'd like. This might be some really good revision of a lot of the stuff I've said throughout this series to just go through and read this. One of the sections I really like in this documentation is this deep dive section. In here, they have a series called Everything You Want to Know About, and you can go into any one of these and it will tell you literally everything in the entire universe you could want to know about these things. So let's say you're working on a project and you need to do something with arrays, and you want to look at something that will just tell you everything you can do with arrays. Well, here it is. It starts with what is an array, of course, and makes sense. Then it's followed by all the different ways of creating arrays, You'll notice there's actually ways described here that I didn't cover in this series. There's alternate ways of making arrays that you could look at. It goes into indices, some tricks you can do with the square brackets on arrays. It tells you how arrays behave with null, which is a special value you can put into variables that means no value. Uh, it tells you about using arrays alongside for and alongside switch, another thing I didn't tell you about in this series. They have all the operators that you could ever possibly apply to an array in here. It just goes on to tell you everything you could ever possibly want to know. And they've got this on a few different topics for you to browse as you please. There's also one other thing I want to bring your attention to in this documentation. And that's this reference section down here. If you go into here and head into powershell.core and about, they have a huge range of topics here about pretty much everything in the language. For example, I could go into the About Properties section here, and it will give me a breakdown of every single operator in PowerShell and what they do. Quite a lot of these we know about, but there's a lot we also don't, and it's all here. So this documentation is useful when you want to actively seek information, but what if you're working on something and need to research about something? For example, in my FFmpeg module here, I use the type date time. How did I know that I can use toString to turn it into hours, minutes, seconds? How did I know that this is a thing you can do? Well, I just searched it up on Google. And when you are searching for something specific, there's a few tricks I want to lay out for you. The first thing to try if you're searching for something is to just say PowerShell date time convert to minutes colon seconds. And you'll get a number of results that are very specific to PowerShell. But sometimes, especially for more obscure types, this won't get you what you want. And in those instances, what you can search instead is for .NET and then the type. Remember that a lot of these types come from .NET, which is a gigantic library of types used by many languages. So if there's not a PowerShell specific guide on something, the .NET documentation might be useful. 
For example, here's the date time page on the .NET documentation. And if you scroll down a bit, look at this. It's got a lot of really detailed general information about the date time type. Now, just to warn you, these pages do tend to use C sharp code, which you presumably don't know. But you can generally intuit what it's getting at because the syntax, the writing between PowerShell and C sharp is quite similar in some ways. So if I want to figure out how to turn the date time into a string, I can just look on this page and it has a whole section about formatting date times as strings and what's available there. And this is how you can find info about any type. So with this in mind, here's my list of how to get information about doing certain things. Number one, search for how to do that thing under PowerShell first. If you don't get any guidance from that, search for how to do that thing under .NET or C Sharp, and you might be able to figure it out from there, perhaps. And number three, if you can't get help from either of those, then you do have one other choice. There are many online help communities like Stack Overflow, or a pretty good one I'm actually on myself, the official PowerShell Discord server, so you can use those too if that's ideal. And, well, actually, that's it. I'm kind of out of things to say. This is it. Two years in the making, I finally finished the series. Sorry for all the delays involved, and everyone who stuck with me the past two years watching this series grow. Thanks, seriously. I don't usually do this in my videos, but since this is quite a milestone, I'll take this now as a chance to talk a little bit about the channel's future and whatnot. This channel isn't a PowerShell channel, it's a programming channel, and I'm going to take a bit of a break from PowerShell after this video. That's not to say there won't be more PowerShell videos, I do want to make a fun video about making a graphical interface in PowerShell, but not immediately. I want to cover some different, much more complex programming topics here too. With all of this said, I think that's all I have really. In the description you'll find a bunch of resources for closing this series off all kinds of stuff there. So just take a look. Thanks, and I'll catch you later.